Hey guys, welcome to the third episode of Short Bits by Shorty. Um, I'm going to go over Dr. Ellis' stuff in this episode in 20 minutes or less, which actually isn't that bad. Um, so here we go. So here's a table that Dr. Ellis made. It's um, slide 16 in his first PowerPoint. It just goes over all the um, drug classes and their mechanisms. Um, I just wrote it out for you just as a reference, but if you can't read my handwriting, please go back to slide 16 of PowerPoint 1. Okay, so there's four categories of beta-lactams. There's penicillins, there's carbapenems, cephalosporins, and monobactams. Penicillins end with psyllin, carbapenems end with penem, um, cephalosporins begin with ceph or ceph, and nestrionam is the only monobactam available. <coughs> um, I'm also showing the core structures, I'm not drawing the rest of the structures, just the important ones for you to recognize. So penicillins, have the core beta lactam ring plus a five membered sulfur a ring with a sulfur in it. Carbapenems are just like penicillins, the beta lactam ring with the five membered ring, except there's no sulfur and there's a double bond. So just think carbapenems are like penicillins, except just look for the double bond here. Cephalosporins are bigger than carbapenems because they have a six membered ring instead of a five member ring. And the way I remember it is carbapenems, C-A-R, um, comes before C-E-P in the alphabet. Um, e is bigger than A, so six membered rings are bigger than five member rings. So basically, Ceph comes after carb in the alphabet, so six membered rings come after five member rings. And monobactams are easy because mono means one, Bactem means beta lactam ring. So there's just one beta lactam ring, no other rings attached. Um, in case he has, you know the names of these rings. Penicillins have a thiazolidine ring. This is the thiazolidine ring. Carbapenems have the dihydropyrrole ring, um, which is over here. And you notice that carbapenems and cephalosporins both have two side chains, R1, R2, R1 and R2. Um, so both beta-lactam classes that starts with C, carbapenems and cephalosporins both start with C, so they have two side chains. And these side chains influence the efficacy in their pharmacology. Okay, so to understand how penicillins work, you have to understand how the cell walls are synthesized. So here's the wild type mechanism. So at first, you have the outer membrane outside. Underneath it, you have the peptidoglycan layer. And then underneath that, with most inwards, is the inner membrane. So within the peptidoglycan layer, there's NAM, there's NAG, and there's another NAM. So both NAMs are denoted NAM number one and NAM number two. And at each NAM are connected um, different uh, protein residues. So L-alanine, D-glutamine, -glutam M-DAP, D-alanine, and D-alanine. I memorized the order. Um, so the one connected most to um, NAM is L-alanine. Then going outwards towards the outer membrane is D-glutamine, M-DAP, D-alanine, and D-alanine. Same on the other, on NAM number two is L-alanine, connected most to it. Then going outwards is D-glutamine, M-DAP, D-alanine, and D-alanine. <coughs> so the way that um, cross-linking works, which provides the peptidoglycan layer or the cell wall with structure and rigidity and its flexibility, is uh, by number one, the active site serine. Um, see, active site serine forms a covalent bond at D-alanine, 
I'm gonna circle it. So this is the alanine, the active site serine from uh, transpeptidase, which is a penicillin binding protein, um, attacks, and this releases the alanine over here. So after you release the alanine, MDAP over here uh, forms the cross link with the alanine, and this releases transpeptidase. So as you can see, you form a cross link between oh crap, you form a cross link between these two um, sections of the peptidoglycan layer, which forms a cross link and provides the structure and flexibility within the cell membrane. So again, just to go review. Um, cell wall is synthesized by transpeptidase attacking through the trans through the um, active site serine at the at this bond between the alanine and the alanine. So the serine within the transpeptidase attacks over here, re which releases this the alanine. After that, MDAP in over here attacks the the alanine over here and forms the cross link. And this provides the cell wall with the stru structure and flexibility. And remember that the first step, the alanine, is, the alanine is, re is released. The second step, transpeptidase is released. And remember that this is a covalent bond, meaning that it's a suicide inhibitor or an irreversible inhibitor. So let me highlight that. So remember that this is an irreversible This is an irreversible or suicide inhibition because of the covalent bond that's formed. <coughs> and if I was to come up with a test question for this, um, which residue in transpeptidase is responsible for attacking the peptidoglycan layer? The answer is serine. So remember, the active site serine within transpeptidase, transpeptidase forms the covalent bond. So remember that serine attacks the peptidoglycan layer. Okay, so the way that beta-lactams work now, now that I've given you how cell walls are made, is that the active site serine, remember that serine of transpeptidase is involved in cross-linking. So if you, stop trans, if you stop the serine, or if you stop the transpeptidase by this beta-lactam, then you prevent cross-linking. So what beta-lactams do is they form covalent bonds with the serine of transpeptidase, and this prevents covalent bonds forming between the D-alanine and the transpeptidase. So if you stop transpeptidase from forming covalent bonds regularly, then you prevent cross-linking and you prevent cell wall synthesis. So what beta-lactams do is therefore prevent cell wall synthesis by forming covalent bonds. Um, covalent bonds, that's important. Oh, let's see why. By forming covalent bonds with the serine residue of transpeptase instead of D-alanine in the regular mechanism over here. Over here. So since I said that this is a covalent bond mechanism, what type of inhibition is this? It's reversible suicide inhibition. Remember, covalent bonds are a type of reversible, irreversible, oh, did I say irreversibles? I meant, ooh. so remember that covalent bonds are a type of irreversible or suicide inhibition, not reversible, irreversible suicide inhibition. Okay, now that I've showed you how the drugs work, I'm going to show you how bacteria have um, worked up resistance against these drugs. 
So there's two classes, or there's two types of drug resistance. There's class, there's resistance by class A, C, and D enzymes, or there's resistance by resistance by class B enzymes. So class C, A, C, and D enzymes work in two different ways. One way is that they form a stable bond, specifically a stable acyl enzyme bond with beta-lactam. So as you can see here, transpeptidase over here forms a bond over here with beta-lactam, with thereby inactivating beta-lactam. And this is a stable bond, so transpeptidase and the beta-lactam drug are stuck together. And since it's a covalent bond, what type of inhibition is this? It's suicide or irreversible inhibition. Remember that suicide or irreversible, irreversible inhibition utilizes uh, covalent bonds. So the second type of drug resistance mechanism is through beta-lactamases. So beta-lactamases first step bind water, and by, after binding water, this complex, the beta-lactamase and water complex, attacks between uh, transpeptidase and the drug. And this releases the inactive drug and an active beta-lactamase. So as you can see here, um, beta-lactamase over here is free and active to inactivate more of the beta-lactams. And the beta-lactam drug right here, ignore this single bond here, is inactivated, so it cannot bind to any more peptidoglycan layer. Um, so apart from class A, C, and D enzymes, there's class B enzymes. And these are different because they use, instead of transpeptidase or beta-lactamases, they use two zinc, two zinc metals, two metal zincs, and water as a hydroxide ion. And this complex of two zincs and one hydroxide attacks the drug and inactivates the drug. So two, two, actually three different resistance mechanisms. There's transpeptidase forming a stable bond. There's beta-lactamases um, using water to attack the drug and releasing the, in, the active beta-lactamase and the inactive drug. And there's two zincs, uh, water, as the form of hydroxide which attack the drug. So now I'm going to discuss the structure activity relationships of the penicillins. So there's two key concepts related to this. There's acid stability or oral absorption or oral availability, or and there's also beta -lac beta lactamase sensitivity or resistance to beta lactamase. So penicillin G, we're going to start with that. Um, penicillin G is not resistant to beta lactamase, and it's not orally available. Um, the key to finding orally available, oral availability is finding electron withdrawing groups. For example, nitrogen, um, oxygen, or fluorine. So oral availability or acid stability depends on electron withdrawing groups. And you're going to look for nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, NOF. So to illustrate this, we've got ampicillin, or actually penicillin 5. So remember that penicillin G is not orally available because it's not acid stable, because it doesn't have an electron withdrawing group after this um, amide group. So look for the amide group always on the left side. And then if there's an oxygen, nitrogen to the left side of the amide, nitrogen to the left side of the amide, then you're gonna have it's gonna be orally available. Um, now there is also uh, beta lactamase sensitivity or resistance. And you can tell beta lactamase resistance or sensitivity by the presence of bulky groups or steric or methyl groups on the left side also. Um, let's see. So, let's see, beta-lactamase, beta-lactamase resistance, look for 
Derek Volk. Like two rings or oh wow that sucks. Or uh mm. or a methyl. That's good enough. Okay. Um, okay. So, to illustrate this, we have... What is this? Uh, methicillin. So, always look for the left side of the amide. The N double one O. And here you have the bulk steric um, phenyl ring with a methyl here and a methyl here. So, methicillin is resistant to beta-lactam. Um, because beta lactamase, because it has a steric bulk right here with the phenyl ring and the two methyls. Like I said, look for the ring with a methyl or two rings. Nafcillin is resistant to beta lactamase because it has two rings over here on the left of the amide. So always look for the amide when you want to look for PO availability or beta lactamase resistance. So this is beta. Nafcillin is beta lactamase resistant because it has two rings right here to the left of the amide. So, to review, why are these methicillin and nafcillin not oral availability, orally available? Because they lack the electron withdrawing group. So if you look to the left of the methyl, left of the amide in methicillin, there's no N, O, or F to the left of it. So, you can't take it orally, so you have to do it parenterally. Same way, Nafcillin, look to the left of the amide, there is no N or F directly connected. Even though you see it, um, ooh, an, uh, ooh, an ether, ethyl ether over here, the OET, it's, not, it's only connected to the ring, not to directly to the amide. So look to the left of the amide, directly to the left of it, there's no N or F, not, therefore it's not orally available. Therefore, you have to take her parenterally. So, why are oxacillin, cloxacillin, and dicloxacillin, forgot the label here, orally available? Remember, it looks to the left of the amide. Here's the amide. You see directly connect to it. Directly connect to it. Not like here, we have a ring, and connected to that ring is uh, an ethyl ether. So, directly connected to the amide is an oxygen and a nitrogen. So it's electron withdrawing, so it's orally available. Cloxacillin is orally available because directly connected to the left of the amide. Here's the amide, look to the left. Directly connected to it is an oxygen and a nitrogen. So it is orally available because they're electron withdrawing groups. Dicloxacillin, named that way because di, there's two clox, cl, there's two chlorines. Oxacillin, oxazole over here, and psyllin over here. Isn't it cool how things are named? Anyways, um, so dicloxacillin is orally, avail orally available because you have looked to the left of the amide, directly connected to it. There's two, ele two electron withdrawing groups. There's oxygen and there's nitrogen. So remember that for the structure activity relationships of the penicillins, Look to the left of the amide for both oral availability and beta lactamase resistance. If there's directly connected to the left of the amide, an electron withdrawing group, such as nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, that are directly connected to the um, amide, then it's orally available. If not, you have to take a parenterally. Um, um, you can tell beta lactamase resistance if there's steric bulk. So look for methicillin, which has a ring with two methyls. Or nafcillin, which has just two rings, two phenyl rings. So Dr. Ellis didn't really go into much detail on this, but I thought I'd mention it because it's in his slides. So beta lactamase inhibitors work through suicide or irreversible inhibition. So remember, in my last previous pre previous videos, we've always had suicide or irreversible inhibition. Like I stated earlier in this video. What are suicide or irreversible inhibitors? They're, ir they're inhibitors that form covalent bonds 
with their substrate. So remember that suicide or irreversible inhibitors form covalent bonds with their substrates. Um, there's three types that doc there's three drugs that Dr. Ellis talked about. There's Sobactam, clavulanic acid, and tazobactam. And you can these are used so that you can use drugs you've been using to treat gram positive species like um, ampicillin, penicillin five, um, and so forth, so that these drugs don't aren't inactivated by beta lactamase, and they can work on the bacteria with originally without beta lactamase. Okay, right. so now you have the cephalosporins, and I'm going to talk about their structural activity relationship. Um, so remember the cephalosporins, um, they come after carbapenems, so 6 comes after 5, so cephalosporins have a 6-membered ring next to the beta-lactam ring, and they have two um, R groups, or two side chains. Remember that carbapenems and cephalosporins both start, both start with C, so they both start both have two side groups, side chains. So remember that the left side of the molecule always confers acid stability and beta lactamase resistance, just like the penicillins. So the left side of the penicillins, like I stated earlier, have beta lactamase resistance and acid stability. Likewise, the like the left side of the cephalosporins have acid stability or beta lactamase resistance. And you can find that at the C3, carbon 3 end, or the R1 side chain. Um, and different groups that Dr. Ellis talked about are alpha aminoamide, alpha methoxyamide, and methoxy, only in the second generation cephalosporins. Um, the right side of the molecule, the R2 group, or the C7 group, aids the activity of the cephalosporins. And an important note that Dr. Ellis made is that the ring strain is about the same as penicillins. And remember that ring strain is important because it allows the penicillin molecules to open up when um, breaking up the cross-linking. So high ring strain, like over here, um, is important in its chemical activity. So the ring strain in cephalosporins is just about the same as penicillins. So they have just about the same activity in breaking up the cross-linking. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the carbapenems. So remember, carbapenems, carb comes before ceph in the alphabet, 5 comes before 6 in the alphabet, so this is a 5-membered ring over here. Um, important things to know about this, over here in the red, if you're, color, if you're colorblind, I'll circle that, I'm circling it for you. So over here in the red, or the top over here if you're colorblind, um, the sulfur, which is different from the penicillins. So in the penicillins, you have a sulfur over here. So with penicillins, you have a sulfur here. Carbapenems, you don't have a sulfur here in that same spot. So this causes an increased ring strain, and this ring strain is also enhanced by the double bond over here. So theoretically, it has a higher activity for breaking up the cross-linking compared to penicillins because of the increased ring strain from changing the sulfur to a carbon and from the double bond. And this molecule, or carbapenems, are not oral available. Why? Because, well, I didn't draw this whole structure because I'm lazy, but carbapenems don't have acid um, R groups on the left side or have with electron withdrawing groups or eh, nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine withdrawing groups on the left side. And remember that the left side of the molecules in the beta-lactams confer their oral availability and their beta-lactamase resistance. So since there's no electron withdrawing group on the left side, like nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, it's not only available, so you have to take it parenterally. Um, one key thing is that if this R2 group was a methyl, methyl, then it confers resistance to hydrolysis by dehydropeptidase 1. In English, 
if you put a methyl over here, you can't degrade, you can't hydrolyze, you cannot hydrolyze this molecule by dehydropeptidase 1. Okay, so monobactams, these are, these are easy to remember because mono means 1, bactam refers to the beta lactam ring, so there's one beta lactam ring, no other rings to the left or the right, well, attached to it directly like the others, carbapenem cephalosporins. Um, this is easy because just like the methyl in the carbapenems confers stability against dehydropeptidase, so the methyl over here at the top confers resist stability against dehydropeptidase, the methyl over here confers stability to beta-lactamase. Okay. So the next class of drugs we're going to talk about are the glycopeptides. For example, vancomycin and dalbovancin. So the mechanism, or the way these drugs work, is by competing with transpeptidase at binding to dialanine, dialanine with five hydrogen bonds. So in English, you have, remember that cell wall synthesis is made by uh, chemical reactions at the dialanine, dialanine site of the peptidoglycan layer. So, um, vancomycin or dalbovancin work by binding competitively to dialanine or dialanine. So it's like a little helmet. V vancomycin and D dalbovancin act as little helmets to protect dialanine and dialanine from covalent interactions with transpeptidase. If you don't know the mechanism, refer back to earlier in my video, I talk about the uh, mechanism of transpeptidase and how transpeptidase forms the cross-linking. So if vancomycin and dalbovancin protect dialanine and dialanine, then you can't form cross-linking, therefore you don't form the cell wall, therefore bacteria die. Um, and chemically this happens by vancomycin, or vancomycin forming five hydrogen bonds with the dialanine dialanine or the peptidoglycan um, protein residues. So important things. Competitive inhibition, therefore it's not covalent bonds, it's just hydrogen bonding. Remember that only covalent bonds refer, covalent bonds only refer to irre irreversible or suicide inhibition. So since it's competing, it's not forming covalent bonds, it's just forming, in this case, hydrogen bonds. So uh, vancomycin and dalbovancin compete with transpeptidase, by forming a helmet or binding to dialanine dialanine. Okay, so the way bacteria found a way around vancomycin is by changing the, ami the amino acid or the protein sequence in the petitoglycan layer. So instead of having dialanine dialanine over here, so dialanine dialanine over here, you change the last dialanine to D-lactate. So instead of, instead of having dialanine dialanine, you have dialanine D-lactate. And by doing this, vancomycin can't form all five hydrogen bonds because it's a different amino acid or a different group over here instead of dialanine. And if vancomycin can't form those hydrogen bonds, then it can't compete with the binding site against transpeptidase. Therefore, you can't prevent cross-linking and therefore bacteria survive. Okay, so I just included these for completeness. We probably won't be tested on the structures of these because you didn't really talk about them, just the mechanism. So I'm just going to go over the mechanisms real fast. Um, there's, three there's three other drug classes that Dr. Ellis talked about. There are cyclic lipo lipopeptides, daptomycin, cyclic peptides, bacitracin, polymyxin E, or cholestin, and there's chlorhexine, which are polyguanidine groups. Um... <coughs> So cyclic lipopeptides, daptomycin, um, it binds to the cell membrane, which leaks potassium. And when you leak potassium, dis you disrupt DNA, RNA, and protein synthesis. Um, daptomycin also binds to phospholipid head groups and fatty acids in the membrane. So this is the specific me mechanism by which it binds to the cell membrane. 
So daptomycin binds to the phospholipid head groups in the cell membrane and the fatty acids. The, it binds to the phospholipid head groups of fatty acids in the cell membrane. And by binding to the, to the cell membrane, it leaks potassium. By leaking potassium, you disrupt DNA, RNA, and protein synthesis. Um, cyclic peptides like bacitracin or polymyxin E or cholestin, they inhibit dephosphorylation of C55 isoprenyl pyrophosphate. And this is a transporter for the poly Glycan, peptidoglycan layer. So if you disrupt the transporter for the peptidoglycan layer, specifically C55 isoprenyl pyrophosphate, then you disrupt uh, cell wall synthesis. Uh, chlorhexidine, uh, look f it's a polyguanidine molecule. So look for the guanidine group in here. If he ever asked you, f if he ever asked us for this on the exam, look for the guanidine group, which is uh, amine, double bonded amine and an amine. And the way this works is by membrane disruption. Um, <coughs> okay, so that's everything in a nutshell. Let me review. Well, that's all three lectures in a nutshell. Wow, ooh, the text got bigger. Anyways, um, let me review everything I went over real fast. All right, wow, okay. Um. So here's the table I wrote from slide 16 of his first lecture. Um, four classes of beta-lactams, penicillin, carbapenem, cephalosporins, and monobactams. Each have different pref prefixes and suffixes. Know those not just for this exam, but all the other exams, and even your own practice. Um, penicillins have a thiazolidine ring. Carbapenems have dihydropyrrole ring. Um, remember, carbapenems... Car comes before Sev, five comes before six, so carbapenems have five membered rings next to the beta lactam ring. Cephalosporins have six membered rings next to the beta lactam ring. And carbapenem cephalosporins both start with C, so they both have two side chains. Um, so, <coughs> in wild type bacteria, normal bacteria, cell walls are made through the peptidoglycan layer. Um, there's a sequence of amino acids, L-alanine, D-glutamine, M-DAP, D-alanine, D-alanine. Um, the cross-linking forms between M-DAP and D-alanine in the NAM um, oh, sugar groups. And transpeptidase is the enzyme that helps this happen through the active site serine. And this happens through irreversible suicide inhibition, being that covalent bonds form. The way that beta-lactams work is that they work, is that they act against the active site serine of transpeptidase, and so that transpeptidase can't form these um, cross-linkings between the NAMs and the D-alanine and MDAP. <laughs> um, bacteria found a way around this by two, with two mechanisms. There's class A, C, and D enzymes, and there's class B enzymes. Class B enzymes use two zincs and water in the form of hydroxide to attack the drug, and class A, C, and D enzymes form either a stable complex. Oh man, a stable complex with either transpeptidase in the drug, or they release active trans active beta beta lactamase, an inactive drug. Uh, remember the structure activity relationships of penicillins. They have always look on the left side for a oral availability and beta lactamase resistance. Oral availability, look for the electron withdrawing group to the left of the amide, so either N, O, or F to the left of an amide, directly to the left of an amide. Uh, beta lactamase resistance, beta lactamase resistance, you either have the phenyl with two methyls here in methicillin, or two phenyl groups like nafcicillin. There's three beta lactamase inhibitors, sulbactam, clavulanic acid, and tazobactam. Um, these work through suicide or irreversible inhibition, so by forming covalent bonds. Cephalosporins have two side chains. The left side, remember the left side confers its acid stability and beta lactamase resistance. Um, the right side, the R2 group, converts, confers activity or enhances the activity of the cephalosporins. Cephalosporins have similar ring strains penicillins. Carbapenems um, have theoretically increased ring strain because 
of the conversion from sulfur to carbon here and the double bond here. And if and it's not oil available, remember, because there's no acid group or, or electron withdrawing group, NO or F on the left side of the molecule. If this R2 group if this R2 group is a methyl, it's resistant to dehydropeptidase 1. Converse in the same way, uh, if you have a methyl group in the monobactams, you have stability against beta-lactamase. Vancomycin, oh crap, vancomycin and dalbovancin work by competing with transpeptidase at the dialanine-dialanine site by forming a helmet or preventing transpeptidase from attacking uh, through five hydrogen bonds. So this is a co not a covalent interaction, therefore it's not irreversible or suicide inhibition. It's just competitive inhibition. Um, bacteria found a way around this by converting one of the alanines, oh, the alanines to delactate. And there's some other drugs that Dr. Ellis talked about. Don't feel like reviewing them right now. So that's all the chemistry in these three lectures in a nutshell. I tried to not include much chemistry, but tried to simplify the chemistry into words, which is what he might do on the exam, hopefully. Um, so hopefully this is a simplified version of his lectures. If you have any questions, let me know. Also, if you have any feedback, feel free to provide them at... Oh, man, I hate when that happens. Pull ev.com slash c h r i s t i a n r u i 629 again if you have any feedback good or bad please feel free to provide it on a scale of 1 to 10 1 equals 10 out of the 1 equals would not watch again 5 equals a plus good job also feel free to provide uh, any specific feedback if you have feedback about the specific video, please mention the specific video so I can improve things in the future. Thanks guys, good luck on the exam.